All right, everybody, and uh, welcome to the webinar tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the basal ganglion. We're going to be spending about 20, not 20 minutes on at each seminar, so let's get this thing going. Uh, one of the things that we have to address right out of the gate when we're dealing with basal ganglion, we have to look at the gut function. Almost all of the movement disorders that uh, come from the basal is going to we'll start in the gut first. So we have to understand the gut, and then how does the gut negatively impact uh, the, the brain stem and then the brain stem uh, ne negatively impact basal ganglion function. So we've got to link all of that together and then show you some treatment programs over the next three weeks. So let's get this thing rolling. All right. So if we draw this thing out uh, to start with the gut, we have a single epithelial cell layer here. All right. And and then this is literally separates us separates the body, uh, the gut from from our body, if you will, our bloodstream. So we've got our uh, microvilli here, okay. And then uh, in here we have our gut function. All right. Now what's amazing about this this gut function is that your 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 gut even your microbiome uh, communicates with your brain. And it's going to do that through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve comes in here, all right? And let me change this up a tad bit. This is that 80-20 split right here, all right? So 80% of the information from the vagus nerve is going up, okay? So that's going to be 80%. And then 20% is coming from what is called the CAN or the Central Autonomic Network. Okay, so that's, that's actually a real name, Central Autonomic Network. And then this, this, uh, our brain uh, is also protected by what is called a blood-brain barrier. Our gut is protected uh, uh, by a gut barrier. And the amazing thing about this brain barrier and gut barrier, uh, this the same uh, actin myosin, myosin and and the uh, zonulin and occludin that actually control the transport of products, digested proteins through the gut into the bloodstream are the same actin and myosin, same uh, zonulin and occludin that actually control the uh, brain barrier. So you got a leaky gut, we're going to have to look at leaky brain. So in here, in this gut, what we have is uh, we have the aplicin nucleon. So let's let's look at some numbers here, not to bore you with numbers, but in the brain, we have 86 billion neurons. Uh, research suggests that it's about 7,000 synapses through each. Each one of these neurons has at least 7,000 synapses. So a total of about 500 trillion. Okay, if you're not sure how much that is, that's about equivalent to the national debt. Okay, my jokes are terrible, by the way. Uh, and, and see, so 86 billion. Uh, in the spinal cord, we have about uh, 69 million. And in the enteric nervous system, we have approximately 400 million. Now, this, why am I telling you all this? Why does all this make a rip? Because the same exact neurotransmitters that's in the gut, enteric nervous system, the enteric nervous system is known as our second brain, okay? So the, the same neurons that communicate in the enteric nervous system are the same neurons used in the, in the brain. So again, I'm, I'm making a correlation here between if you slow down gut motility, okay, that is actually the first movement disorder. And the reason for this is one of the reason is called alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein. These make Lewy bodies. Now, in the gut, again, enteric nervous system, uh, we have what is called alpha synuclein, just one of the neurotransmitters. Okay. All right, alpha synuclein. Now, this alpha synuclein. Uh, we have the uh, axon, then we have the uh, the dendrite, and inside here we've got our neurotransmitter or the synaptic gap. The alpha synuclein actually controls how much of the neurotransmitter is actually produced in the synaptic cleft. Now, the reason this is important is there is a thing in when it comes to uh, Parkinson's, Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is not a disease. It's, it's, it leads to... Uh, uh, it precedes the actual Parkinson's disease. Like, for example, if you see somebody, see somebody moving with uh, 
flex for uh, head forward flex posture no moving not moving their arms uh, that that's a sign of parkinsonism that may lead to parkinson's okay uh, just just realize that so but the first movement disorder is going to be our gut and i'm showing you why here because again you've got 86 trillion neurons in the brain that make 500 trillion connections we only have 69 million neurons in our spinal cord but we have 400 million in our gut, so in the in, in this in our gut, the enteric nervous system, the same neurotransmitter that control gut motility, is the exact same transmitter that control uh, optimal function in our brain, focus, attention, and concentration, being able to sleep. The uh, neurotransmitter that has been studied the most that's causing these problems with Parkinsonism, which is linked to the basal ganglion, is alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein is it controls a protein that actually controls the amount of neurotransmitter that goes across the synaptic cliff. Now, what happens with this alpha synuclein because of inflammation, uh, because of blood sugar dysregulation, uh, because of uh, what else can we have? Uh, poor diet, uh, standard American diet, uh, standard American lifestyle, sitting on our duff all day watching TV. Uh, occult pathogens. Uh, just had a, a, in the last week, and one of the ladies came back with her blood work today, I uh, had a gentleman last week that came in with what is called porphyromus gingivalis, and that's uh, periodontal disease, and he actually has a, 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 a bacteria that's actually dump, dumping up into the bloodstream. Then a lady comes in and gets her blood work in today, and she has streptococcus mutans, which is linked to gingivalis. Now, see, these two things here just by themselves, dumps right into the bloodstream, and it can, it can. I'm not saying that it does, but scientific research says that it states that it can lead to uh, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because of the inflammatory process. Now, what's so amazing about this, too, is I said inflammation, and the number one leading cause or the most common cause of inflammation is called leaky gut. All right. This is inflammation. What triggers this alpha synuclein uh, to what's called protein aggregation? It means it clumps together. And all of these neurotransmitters, they have a three-dimensional uh, shape. Their, their amino acid sequence determines the design or the structure of, of their, their, their protein. All right. And when they become aggregated and they clump together, then what happens? Think of it like you hear this all the time. Well, maybe not all the time, but uh, in war, you hear things like radar jamming or computer jamming, and that's what happens here is you, uh, you're jamming the communication between this axon and this dendrite. Okay, so we're jamming that communication. It slows down, and then one of the first things we're going to see with patients is gut motility is being altered, and they're going to have things like constipation, right? So leaky gut, how do we test this? Cyrex number two, all right? All right, that's one of the ways that we're gonna test this. How do we, why do we test the clue of occult pathogens that we just talked about? Things like corporomus gingivalis, streptococcus mutans, uh, mold, uh, uh, tick bites. See, these are things that I test on 99% of our patients and you'll test this on Cyrex number 12, okay? And, and so and I'm just giving you a few things here that we have to look at because I don't want you to be that guy or gal that calls me up and says, this patient has Parkinson's and then what do I do? Like it's some kind of damn magic bullet that we're going to pull out to solve this. And these are not magic bullet formulas. This is what we need. I need you to think about it from this standpoint from now on. We're never using a magic bullet. We're using magic buckshot, okay? Because when we deal with these basal ganglionic disorders, there's not one thing you're going to do. There's going to be 15 to 20 things you're going to have to do, okay, just from a metabolic standpoint. Now, <clears throat> here's the amazing thing about this is through this vagus nerve right here, what I have in green and blue is the vagus nerve, literally what happens, the, this alpha synuclein, what it starts to do is it actually starts to travel up this vagus nerve, okay, as it ascends up. And actually, they've done research and showed that if you actually uh, cut vagus nerve, people don't get Parkinson's from that. But again, uh, what's the side effect of cutting your vagus nerve? Well, your brain can't communicate with your gut. 
And then your brain also is not going to be able to communicate with your heart, lung, liver, and all of that because you see your brain controls to your autonomic nervous system through the vagus nerve, all of those autonomic functions. So now what happens here when this crawls up and then we get into what is called our brain stem, okay, then uh, in the brain stem, all right, so let's look at this. All right, so we've got our medulla down here. Now, what's, what's in here? We've got uh, our vagus nerve, the headquarters of our vagus nerve in here. Remember, when we're dealing with the vagus nerve, we talk about it as though it's just one. We actually have a vagus nerve on the right and left side, so let's don't forget that. Now, this vagus nerve, okay, when it gets into the brain stem and this medullary area, then we can actually start to really see some autonomic dysregulation. Uh, and and so people start to have what is called dysautonomic nomia. It means that multiple autonomic systems are starting to fail. Why is that? Because this this alpha synuclein has literally climbed all the way up into uh, our brainstem, into the vagus nerve, and then we get in. And a patient came in last week. I didn't accept it for care, and now we got this cranial nerve seven. So it's climbing on up. Okay. Now we've hit the pont pontine area. What's in the pontine area? Well, in the pontine area, uh, seven controls uh, our facial muscles. So what happens? We start to lose facial tone. So see, again, this is another symptom of Parkinsonism. So one of the first is going to be gut motility, constipation. And this thing starts to climb up the vagus nerve. We start to get dysautonomia. We start to get an autonomic disarray. People come in and they're like, man, I just, I've got all kinds of problems. Cold hands, cold feet, uh, heart, blood pressure's out of control. My bl blood pressure goes up and down. My heart rate goes up and down. I'm having trouble breathing. Uh, one day my gut is, we got gut motility issues. Next minute we got uh, uh, with, with uh, constipation. And the next day we've got uh, diarrhea, okay? So dysautonomia is the name of that. Then we start moving up into the ponds and we start to lose facial tone. So what happens in this situation is when people are looking at you, not when you're talking, you're actually talking to them, we get what is called uh, hypomemia. They start, you actually, their, their mouth literally starts to open. Okay like that. And then the, the guy that came in last week, I didn't accept him for care because see, he had dysautonomia he had hypomemia, and he was actually, see, cranial nerve seven doesn't just control facial tone. It has a parasympathetic output with that for salivation, okay? And uh, so anyway, salivation. So out, off the left side of his mouth, he was actually drooling. He actually walked around, well, he had camptochormia, which is where he's bent over. So see, that's another sign of Parkinsonism that leads to Parkinson's. OK, and, and he's drooling out of his mouth. Why? Because he can't close his mouth because of cranial nerve seven. This thing's going all the way up into the pontine area now and he can't. Uh, he had lost facial tone. We start to get facial masking, you know, that stared look. People look like they're pissed off at you and because they don't have any type of facial response. And then we lose this tone and then we start to salivate. OK, so he literally takes a napkin with him and he's doing doing this. He got bilateral. Parkinson's. He has Parkinson's disease. He's got camptochormia where he's flexed over with a walking cane. Uh, he barely can talk and he's got uh, hypomemia, fast uh, face uh, mass, mass face and drooling. And I just told him, I said, look, you're too far gone. You should have been in here 10 years ago, but there's just nothing we can do for you. Okay. Now, this is where the magic is going to happen right here. Okay. This is where the classic Parkinson comes in. All right. So in the mesencephalon, this black line right here, all right. In the mesencephalon, um, you have what is called the substantia nigra pars compacta. And in substantia nigra pars compacta, this is where your dopamine is made. Now, so so let's let's review here. This we've got this vagus nerve. We start to get alpha synuclein buildup in our gut. How does this happen? Well, I forgot to tell you that. One can be a car wreck that happened 30 years ago. That can lead to a leaky gut and inflammation. We can have blood sugar dysregulation, which I talked about. Inflammation, uh, how do we have inflammation? There's multiple ways, but 
Uh, the, main, the main way that we're going to get it is, number one, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, leaky gut syndrome. Uh, one of the ways is uh, sedentary lifestyle, all right, uh, and that is also standard American diet. Third, that most of you never even heard of or thought about before is called dentition, which is means that we have uh, gum issues, teeth issues that have to be addressed. And it, literally, those are the top three, okay? So when I see doctors saying, well, a patient came in with this and, and, and what's your protocol? I'm like, give me a freaking break here. OK, when somebody asks me and says, Tell me, give me your protocol, I know that that this doctor has no idea the mechanism that they're talking about. OK, and that's the difference between uh, what's called a reductionist and a holist person. Uh, holism is because the reductionist looks at, you know, what's the one thing that I can do uh, like. For example, from a medical standpoint, how do we take this down? Don't look at the forest, let's look at the tree and go, how do we treat this tree? Look at that blinky light syndrome. What drug, this person has a symptom, so what drug can we give them, okay? And I don't wanna hear any chiropractor out there going, yeah, that's right, that's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. It's just wrong with chronic health problems because if you have acute conditions like uh, uh, strep throat or pneumonia, you, need, you may need antibiotics for that, all right? But reductionism is most chiropractors aren't aren't holistic first people. They're reductionists. They, they're no different than chiropractors because we most chiropractors only look at the spine to solve all their problems. And then you actually get this these people that micromanage that are atlas orthogonal, okay, which are complete reductionists. Okay. So you don't you don't allow the patient, uh, you don't fit the patient world, you make the patient fit your world. And see, when you play this holistic game, true holism, what you do is you look at every possible type of scientific research and you go, this is what we're going to do to optimize this person's recovery that's in your scope of practice. And everything that I've talked about here today is, is going to be in your scope of practice, except for if you have to refer somebody out to a dentist, you have to do that. Sometimes I have to send people out to a nurse practitioner to kill off some of these uh, parasites in their gut. You're going to have to do that. That's not in our scope of practice. And then we co-manage these people together because when you deal with patients at this level, medical doctors don't know what to do. Okay. Nurse practitioners don't know what to do. And then there's certain things we can't do because it's not in our scope of practice. So, but again, I'm just letting you know from here, here's what we can do. And we can, we can do the test and test for leaky gut. We can do all the blood work and find out uh, from a from a biochemical standpoint, point, what's malfunctioning, and as a functional neurologist, we actually can stimulate the appropriate neurological systems to help these systems come back online. So this vagus nerve crawl, this I'm sorry, this alpha synuclein crawls up the vagus nerve, and then once we get into this punt, uh, the the medulla area, we start to have this multiple systems atrophy as it starts to climb on up a little bit into the pond, we start to have uh, hypomemia, we start to lose facial tone, we start to have salivation, start to drool and those kind of things. And then it finally hits uh, our uh, mesencephalon and the substantia nigra pars compacta. And then we're not able to actually make dopamine. Now, when it comes to the basal ganglion, and we'll hit this a little bit harder next week, uh, we have what is called the D1 and D2 pathways, and we're going to we're going to talk about this now, and then we'll end up wrapping this thing up tonight. D1 and D2. D1 is the direct pathway. And I'll explain all of this next week, but just get the big picture. And D2 is the indirect pathway. Okay, in the basal ganglion. So you have a direct pathway and an indirect pathway. So think of it like this, in the direct pathway, you're the driver, you're giving the car gas, okay? So that that when the direct pathway is initiated, you actually start to move, all right? So that's the key component. It, it gives the magnitude, okay, and the velocity, if you will, of movement, all right? The indirect pathway in, think of it, or I'm sorry, I in the indirect pathway, uh, I is your a mnemonic for inhibition all right so the direct pathway drives things that drives motion and your indirect pathway what it does it, is, it inhibits movement okay so 
uh, I'll give you an example. I had a patient come in yesterday that started up under care. Uh, he came in for, Lord, I don't even know what he came in with. But one of the things that I did is I said, I want you to, what we're going to do is we're going to look at your cerebellum, frontal lobe, prefrontal lobe, supplemental motor cortex, and your direct and indirect uh, basal ganglionic pathway. So I'm like, what I want you to do is I want you to do rock, paper, knife, and I want you to repeat that for me. Okay, and here's what he's doing. He's going like this. This is as fast as this guy's going. And then I told his wife, I said, now, I want you to do this. I want you to go. I want the wife to do this. And she's like, never done it before. She just nailing it. Okay. So what's happening in this situation is this guy, uh, he can't, he came in with some type of like numbness and tingling all over his body, something like that. Okay. Guy spent over a hundred thousand dollars. His own words, he spent out of pocket over a hundred thousand dollars and nobody's had any answers for this guy. Okay. Now, so what's happening is his direct pathway is starting to fail on him. And this is this can be, and I let him know, I said this can be a sign of Parkinsonism. I'm not saying that you're going to get Parkinson's. I'm just saying one of the signs of this is we start to cognitively slow down. We start to have this movement disorder where we slow down. Okay, we're slowing. It's like go as fast as you can. It's like I'm going as fast as I can. Can't go any go any faster. So that's the indirect pathway that's failed. And then if and then what can also happen is if our let me back up. I told you wrong. That's our direct pathway has failed because we're slowing down. Okay. Because think of it like this: if the direct pathway gives you magnitude and gives you movement, if you lose that, then you're going to slow your processes down. Your mental processes, your your movement disorder, your movements are going to slow down. Now, the indirect pathway inhibits movement, okay? So those two have to work together, okay? Those have to work together. And uh, uh, let's see, you're, you're meeting up, will be up in 10, okay, so it's just giving me a notice, it's gonna be up in 10 minutes, okay. So these two have to work together, the direct and indirect pathway. Everything in the body, if you will, has an agonist and an antagonist relationship, your bicep has the tricep, okay? Your uh, quadriceps has its hamstring. Your parasympathetic has its sympathetic. Your basal ganglion has a, its direct pathway, which gives magnitude. And then the indirect pathway goes, well, let's make sure we slow this thing down and do it just right, okay? Now, if a person has an indirect pathway that's abnormally functioning, what will happen when you get to this with this rock, paper, knife? It's going to be literally like you're like, yo, brother, slow down just a little bit. Slow that. But see, they can't inhibit that movement. Now let's think about this just a second. Next week, when we go through these loops with the direct and indirect pathway. What I want you to know is when we do this movement, okay, this, this is a physical, this is a motor movement, okay? But every one of your thought processes, your frontal lobe, your cognition, your focus, your attention, your concentration, your limbic system, okay? All of this fires through your direct and indirect pathway, not just your, which is in the basal ganglion, not just your motor function. So when we see things like this and a person is slowing down, okay? We start to look at a person's focus, attention, and their concentration, and their cognitive speed, and guess what happens? That slows down as well, okay? So one thing that I want you to understand is that uh, when you're dealing with chronic health patients, and make sure you write this down, nothing happens in isolation. This right here, which is faster than most people with a direct basal ganglion pathway can do it. But the point is that does not happen in isolation. Okay. It, that happens because they, they've got, in one thing, a possible basal ganglionic disorder. And we go, hey, tell me about your gut function. Because the first movement disorder you had is actually in your gut. But also what you should have seen when the patient's walking is they have a slight head forward head carriage. OK, they, they're not swinging their arms properly. Why would they not swing their arms? Well, one of the reasons they wouldn't swing their arms is, again, nothing is in isolation. 
when we deal with chronic health problems is because in this is our mesencephalon and in our mesencephalon we have inside of here we have what is called the red nucleus we have two of these one on the right and one on the left okay so now this basal ganglia i'm sorry this red nucleus what it does it controls your flexor tone so people should move their arms when they're walking in health they should move their hips. They should be able to flex their hips. So what happens in this situation? They stop being able to flex. Now, this is a dead giveaway, is that a patient comes in and you need to start observing your patients. Do they have normal arm swing on one side, but they lose arm swing on the other? So if I'm standing here and I lose arm swing on my left side, this is my right red nucleus. My right red nucleus fires to my left shoulder and my left flexor. So see, these are signs that can happen 5, 10, 20 years before these people actually get Parkinsonism and then or Parkinson. And then I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, there is a Cyrex Lynx test. OK, so I've given you three tests that need to be ran. Number one is leaky gut. That's Cyrex ray number two. Occult pathogens, which is Cyrex ray number 12. And the Cyrex Lynx test uh, can actually tell you if you have uh, a, a leaky brain. Also, it can tell you if you have brain-derived neurotrophic factors that are having an autoimmune disorder uh, attack to it. But see, all of these can be side, solved from a nutraceutical standpoint. And also, um, are you actually producing alpha synuclein? Okay, it'll also let you know, are you releasing uh, amyloid for amyloid placking, tau for uh, amyloid and tau is more for Alzheimer's, but are we actually having uh, uh, amyloid being released? And if it is, there are some things that we're going to have to do about that. What do we do? We reverse engineer it. We look at gluten. We look at any cross reaction uh, to gluten. We look at leaky gut. We look at occult pathogens. We look at, do they have mercury? Do they have formaldehyde issues? Do they have aluminum issues? Do they have pesticides, herbicides? So see, there's tests on all of these things if you know how to do it, okay? And my job is to, un to to actually have a patient. Let's see, let them. Okay, next week we will talk more about the test, but I just want to give you the overview. So we're going to recap because the time's about to run out. So I said tonight that the first movement disorder is going to be in our gut. And, and so I also said that there's 86 million neurons in the brain. There are 69 in the spinal cord and about 400 million, 69 million in the spinal cord and about 400 million in our enteric nervous system. The same neurons that control your enteric nervous system are the same neurons that control brain function. So see, that's why the gut enteric nervous system is called the second brain. And this is why when you negatively impact the gut, you also negatively impact the brain because of the same neurotransmitters. Conversely, it could be said when you negatively impact the brain, you're also negatively impacting the gut because, again, we have a bidirectional communication with the vagus nerve. We also said that uh, we can test this leaky gut through Cyrex array number two. We said that we can test occult pathogens through Cyrex array number 12. And then uh, we can also use the Cyrex Lynx test, Lynx, L-I-N-X, to test to see if we are having any, any type of these uh, of uh, protein aggregation or antibodies. We said that the that, that this alpha synuclein literally what it does is it climbs, climbs up the vagus nerve and then it gets into the medulla. Then we get multiple systems atrophy, moves on up into the pons. We start to affect cranial nerve seven. We start to have facial mask, masking. We get hypomemia losing facial tone, we get salivation, then it moves up into our mesencephalon. It's going to damage our uh, uh, substantia nigra pars compacta. That's where our dopamine is made. Also, again, nothing happens in isolation, that we're also going to uh, lose flexor uh, movement with our shoulders and our hips. Why? Because in the mesencephalon, we don't just have the substantia nigra pars compacta that makes dopamine. We also have the red nucleus, which controls flexor movement. And then I said in the brain, in the basal ganglion, we have the direct and indirect pathway. The direct pathway gives us movement. It gives us amplitude and force. If we lose that, we start to slow down. The indirect pathway inhibits movement. And so when we lose that, we start to move when we're not supposed to move. So if you look at Parkinson's disease, a person is slowing down, okay, flex forward, 
moving their arms, very slow moving, and they have a tremor. So they get the lethal combination of the direct and their direct pathway is being lost. I hope you learned something here tonight. Uh, and I do try to wrap these up in 20 minutes and let's get in, get out, learn something. And then let's start. All you got to do on every patient that comes in is do your rock, paper, knife and see if they slow down or speed up or do it correctly. And and then we'll next weekend, we'll go directly into the basal ganglia and we'll talk about the direct and indirect way. And then the following week, we'll give you some, uh, some, some uh, rehab for that. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week.